Hello, everyone. Welcome to Date with an Author. Um, welcoming Jenny uh, Romer. Uh, she is a lawyer, environmental activist, leading expert on single use plastics. She has been working for over a decade in various cities and states in the US, helping to draft legislation and develop policies to reduce waste, in particular, single, single use plastic. Featured on the Trevor Noah podcast in 2019, more recently on Good Morning America to promote, promote her new book. She's well versed in the ins and outs of recycling systems in the US and um, what works and what does not work within them. I'm so happy to introduce you to her. Welcome, Jenny. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And um, we have, I have a copy of your book here too. Um, and uh, we will definitely show the viewers watching the beautiful illustrations. Um, and I wanted to quickly shout out the uh, illustrator, Christy Young, who is the uh, illustrator of the Rules of series in Good Magazine. So uh, you start the book off by saying, uh, I quote, this book will educate, entertain, and get you fired up. We have a lot of work to do, but I know you're up for the job. So right away, you start off with positive. I know you can do it, that, and that's great. Um, can you give us a summary, a quick elevator pitch about what the, book's, what the book is supposed to do and help people with um, the, the, the viewers, to the viewers? Sure, so the book is primarily about recycling, uh, but a big take home from the book is how to reduce single-use plastic, because you'll see that throughout the book, I talk about what's recyclable and what's not and why. And a big thing is that so much of the single use plastic that we're using right now isn't actually recyclable because no one really wants to buy it and turn it into another item. And I'm a lawyer, I've spent 15 years working on plastics policy and I really just learned so much about the recycling system and how it works. And I wanted to have a book to kind of relay all that information that I've learned over the years but in a fun way. Uh, so it is It is an illustrated book. Some people think it maybe it's a kid's book, but you do learn all about plastic resins and commodities markets. So it's nice to look at, but it's also real. It has a whole lot of information in it. And I tried to, you know, go about this in a positive way. It's a subject that can really weigh people down a lot because you know there are so many staggering statistics there. But I'm a lawyer, I work on this, I work on policy and I do see like a way forward. Great, and before delving further into the book, I wanna go over, I think there's a lot of terms that people get mixed up. Uh, can we, I wanna go over some of these things. Um, can you go over exactly what the mantra is, what it means to reduce, reuse, and recycle? We've seen it on kids' classrooms. We've seen it all over. What does that mean? And what is that hierarchy of reduce, reuse, recycle? Yeah, so the waste reduction hierarchy is reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, but so many of us really, we've been marketed recycling for so long. And that's really the packaged goods industry and primarily the plastics industry have spent just a ton of money making us feel great about recycling. And so, you know, we get that warm, fuzzy feeling a lot of the time when putting something in the recycling bin, even if we aren't quite sure what happens next. And that's that's not by, that's not by accident. That was very intentional by the industry. And so, but what really matters the most is reducing and reusing as much as you can. So for example, bringing your own bag to the grocery store so that you are, you're reducing waste. You're not having to get a single use bag when you're at the store. That's so much better for the environment than trying to recycle a single use bag later. Great. And uh, going on to some more terms that are often, uh, that are kind of spewed at us and marketed toward us that people uh, often mix up uh, and you mentioned in the book are recycled, downcycle and upcycle. Can you tell us, you know, they're often used interchangeably and they're not interchangeable. Can you tell us the difference between the three? Sure, so recycling is turning one item into another item. Uh, it's about the same value. So, re so recycling a plastic bottle into another plastic bottle is an example. Um, and that's something where we can really see a circular economy built from that, where you 
see one thing recycled over and over again into the same thing. Um, with plastic, I talk about it in my book, there are some issues with the polymer chains kind of getting broken um, or the molecular weight re getting reduced when something's recycled more than once. Um, but ideally that's what, what, what would happen. Uh, but downcycling is taking material and turning it into something that is um, not able to be recycled again. So, and then upcycling is turning something into a higher value. And so in my book, I talk about turning, you know, a plastic bo bottle into maybe a pair of shoes or a bag or something that, um, that's advertised a lot. Like a lot of clothing will say like, I used to be a plastic bottle. Um, some people would see that as upcycling because maybe it's a higher value, but I would see it as downcycling in a way because you're not able to then take that pair of shoes and recycle it back into another bottle or so, um, but those are terms that are used all the time. And what I really focus on in the book is recycling. So turning an item into another item um, and about the same value. And I really look at the global commodities market. And so um, recycling is, is, is seen as this kind of feel good activity, but it's really a commodities market and all that like collection and sorting that happens with, at your the city level um, really that material doesn't actually get recycled unless somebody wants to buy it. And so I look at kind of three steps in my book to make some, whether something is recyclable, um, it has to be collected in the majority of jurisdictions, has to be sorted with existing mechanical machinery, and it has to have an end market, have that buyer who wants to turn it into something else. And a lot of things like aluminum cans, those that's in super high demand all of the time. Um, a lot of those those precious metals. Um, and so there is someone that's going to want to buy that and turn it into a new can uh, or something else. And um, so that's what I look at. And I did a lot of research into the commodities market. So I have some cool graphs on like which plastics are actually valuable and which are not valuable at all. Yeah, and those graphs, those infographics, and those charts you have are so helpful in the book and really spell it out, I think, for people who might not have full understanding of the systems. Um, and kind of in the, the vein of written, because you focus on recycling, you also talk about wish cycling. What is wish cycling, and should it, this be something that the everyday person does? Yeah, like I said, people love recycling, and we've been marketed about recycling so much that people will sometimes want to recycle something that isn't recyclable. And so it could either just be someone who isn't paying attention to the rules and is just kind of throwing things in their bin, like not sure. Uh, but it's also people who have read the rules of what's accepted and what's not, but they still are saying, oh, well, I want to recycle my utensils or I want to recycle my plastic bag. And they think that if they put it in their bin, that maybe their city will then magically figure it out. Uh, but that's not how it works. Um, and so my main take home is really follow your local rules. Your cities put a lot of effort into figuring out what they want and they, what they don't want and why. Um, a lot of it is because stuff gets tangled in the machinery. So, um, so plastic bags are considered a tangler and they'll get caught in the machinery. They'll have to shut it down and clean it out. So you're actually hampering the recycling process for other valuable stuff. If you're putting your plastic bags or even things like ho garden hoses and clothing that people put in their, in their curbside bins and then your city just has to spend a lot of money to fish that out of, of the machinery. Um, so don't wish cycle those things. And then other things like really, really tiny things, um, that doesn't really hurt the machinery as much, but if there's stuff that's so small, it's gonna not make it through the machinery or things like forks that are kind of awkwardly shaped. Um, yeah, just pay attention to your local rules and follow them if you want to be a good recycler, don't wish cycle. Um, great. Yeah, I think that's really important because even, like you said, um, people who are aware do it just in case. And um, mm -hmm. I think this book really spells out that um, that's not that's not always the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of before going more into recycling, you do uh, a, ba a basic overview of other waste systems. And I just want to go over especially the ones that most people know. Um, Starting with landfilling, can you just describe, so obviously landfill is an alternative to recycling. It's a different system, not an alternative, but it's a different system. Can you tell us what landfill is, uh, um, especially it's relevant in the US because we do a lot of it. 
Sure, yeah. So landfills are federally regulated. And so a big problem with them, well, at first, nobody really wants them to live near a landfill. It's a big, like, not in my backyard, NIMBY issue, kind of one of the original ones. They're smelly. Uh, there's a lot of pollution issues. And there's leachate that kind of is the is the kind of plastic, or sorry, the, that's the uh, kind of garbage juice that comes out of landfills if they're not sealed properly. Um, and then also methane can escape from, from landfills. So fe under federal regulations, that stuff is all regulated, but it's still something where people don't want to live near them. Um, and uh, it's, and it's, it, they take up a lot of room. We don't have a lot of space left in a lot of our landfills. Um, and landfills are created to have something be in them forever. So if you see something that's marketed as like biodegrades in a landfill, like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> um, we're really, that's where people aren't supposed to market it that way. Um, and so that's just a, something where we want to avoid sending landfills, things to landfills as much as possible. Um, and there are, you know, another alternative is incineration. Um, incineration is also a huge problem. It's basically burning garbage. Um, so you're taking gar the, the trash, you're burning it so that really, you're really like, making a, it's a much smaller quantum, it's much smaller volume, but it causes a ton of air pollution. Um, they're a lot of the time located in low income communities, communities of color, a lot of high asthma rates. Um, so incineration also really not good. Um, and then there's composting, um, composting for food scraps. Um, that's great. It's also, it's hard to find the right place to put big composting facilities, um, but there's a lot of work going on with community composting. Um, and so, and that's really a huge way to divert methane because, you know, there's so much methane coming out of landfills from stuff like not biodegrading all the way, but breaking down a bit. Um, and that releases tons of methane. So we can avoid that greenhouse gas by composting more. So that's a little bit of background on some other alternatives too. But recycling um, really also addresses greenhouse gases because you're avoiding um, not just the, you know, the material extraction. If you're reusing something, you don't have to get it out of the ground. Um, and that, that avoids a lot of greenhouse gas from the extraction part. And you're also not having to landfill it or incinerate it or ship it abroad. Um, so recycling um, is a, way, a great way to you know, reduce our impact on the environment, but we really need to actually be recycling. Like I said, having an item turn into another item rather than just kind of sorted. And then if there's nowhere to put it, it ends up going to, to landfill incineration or the last thing is being shipped abroad. And um, that's something we can talk about more if you want, but it's really, there's been a huge problem of the US shipping our low value plastic waste abroad and calling it recycling, um, where it's really contaminating the environment and, the, and human health in other countries. Yeah, definitely. I have that. Uh, I want to touch on that later when we talk about problems in waste disposal and um, in, in disposing of or getting you know rid of recycling that is not valuable here. Um, but before we move on to our next section, I, we are going to have a little interactive segment where I have some items and I want to ask you so our watchers know what in their everyday lives is or is not recyclable, what the problems are. Um, and I you know you talked a lot about commodity pricing and markets and um, the commodities markets. Uh, is there anything else before I start the demonstration that you want, um, you, you, def you defined it a little bit earlier, but is there anything else you want people to know about commodity pricing before I bring out the items? Um, I think the other steps really are, um, a lot of it has to do with sorting. And so with, um, in my book, I, I have a diagram of the Sims Municipal Recycling Facility in New York City that handles all the um, metal, glass, and plastic for the city. And I show all of the machinery that's used, all the conveyor belts and the, um, the magnets and the air guns and the cameras and everything that's used to sort that recycling, um, those materials. So I think um, I'll go talk about through some of that machinery, I think, as we look at your items. And then another thing with paper specifically um, is that if paper has long fibers, um, then it's more it's recyclable because uh, what recycling does is kind of take all the paper, put it 
I'm going to big steamy cauldron, um, mix it up and then put it through screens. And so the long, the paper with long fibers gets caught in the screens, the short fibers go right through and just end up in the wastewater. So kind of keep that all in mind as we go into your, um, what you have to show me. Great, and actually that's a perfect segment um, when we're talking about long and short fibers. So firstly, I just have regular, you know, a piece of regular old cardboard. Um, mm -hmm. Is this recyclable? Yes, the cardboard is very recyclable. Um, the market kind of goes up and down a little bit, but it always has a value. Um, and those are, those are long fibers and they're very desirable by paper recyclers. Great, thank you for going over cardboard. Now, adjacent to that, I have a pizza box right here. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that recyclable specifically when it has grease on it, when part of it has grease on it and part of it does not? Is uh, that something we can put in our bins? So with that one, it check your local rules. Some cities are a little bit more strict than others about grease levels. So grease can contaminate paper. Um, and so what I suggest is just taking off the parts that are not greasy. So you're usually the top of the box won't have any grease on it. Um, if you, you, if there was a grease liner at the bottom, there's a chance maybe it caught everything. So look for where the grease is, recycle the parts that are not greasy. Some cities are just very paranoid uh, about where that grease is uh, at, or that they don't want any at all. And then some places like New York City, uh, they say, give us all of your pizza boxes, as long as they don't have pizza in it. So just make sure to check your, your rules for that particular um, item. That's great for New York, considering the uh, amount of pizza consumed. <laughs> yeah, and we have a great, this is also highlighted in the book, but in New York City, the there's a, um, a barge that takes most of the municipal paper to a Staten Island and it, our paper gets made into pizza boxes. <laughs> so um, a lot of the time those pizza boxes are actually made back into new pizza boxes. So that's a nice, uh, I try to highlight the positive parts there. Yeah. And um, speaking of um, positive, you talk about, you talked about aluminum cans. Um, what about aluminum felt? the same material, different, uh, different type of product. Yeah, so most jurisdiction will jurisdictions will take aluminum foil. Um, one thing in my book is I talk about how the machinery is all made, is all designed to um, sort items based on what they, this kind of standard size. And so I suggest having people, if they use, you know, a decent amount of aluminum foil to create an aluminum foil ball that they just kind of add to <laughs> throughout the week or a couple of weeks before putting it in the bin. And that way it's kind of more similar in size to an aluminum can. What about if it has food on it or grease or Take something? Take the food out. Yeah. So for everything, make sure that you're cleaning out your containers and that you're rinsing out your aluminum foil. Um, but also, you know, like I said, don't wish cycle. So only give your city what they're looking for. Um, and then you can avoid rinsing out that other stuff that they don't actually want that goes in the trash. And now moving on to big, a lot, of, a lot of straws have been in the news a lot lately. What about your regular plastic straw? Unfortunately, no. So straws are kind of awkwardly shaped and aren't really going to make it into. So the whole point of, of selling these, um, these recyclables on the commodities market is they have to make it through all this machinery and be sorted and then put into a bale, kind of like a hay bale. And straws are awkwardly shaped. They're not going to make it through that machinery very well. And then even if they did, they're made out of a type of plastic that really is not very isn't desirable. So it's usually made out of number six plastic, which is called polystyrene. Um, the kind of more expanded uh, part kind of uh, polystyrene is what a lot of people call styrofoam. Um, we call it foam um, because otherwise DuPont will send a cease and desist order because they own that trademark term. Um, but um, I, but, but if so for plastics, the lower numbers tend to be more recyclable. So number one and number two bottles and jugs, those are the most recyclable plastics on the commodities market. Number six um, is one of the least. Um, so yeah, don't recycle your straws. Um, try to reduce straws as much as you can. Try to, you know, say, no, I don't need a straw with that when you're ordering something. And like, and like you mentioned, it's been in the news quite a bit. There's been a lot of like local laws and state laws about straws recently. 
And you mentioned the two, the, the gap that um, in, there's like a machinery um, for the recycling facilities that do have machine sorting. What is that gap? Like how big is that gap? That would, um, yeah. Yeah, so it tends to be things can make it through if they're about two, over two inches by two inches. And so straws are just so slender. So things like straws, bottle caps, um, are generally not going to be able to make it through. I say in my book that you can try with, with metal bottle caps because there are magnets kind of that are part of the machinery, but they have a little bit more chance of, of getting through the machinery. But you can also, if it's a, if it's a steel bottle cap, you can also kind of put it in a soup can um, <laughs> to, as another kind of cheat to help it get through the machinery. And then with plastic um, bottle caps, you should put them back on the bottles. So that they don't fall through. Yes, and actually that was brings me up to my next. Um, I have a, a you know clear uh, bottle for this is seltzer, but most water bottles are made from this. Is this recyclable? And can you flatten it to recycle it? How does it? How should it be recycled if you can recycle it? So that's a um, number one. So P made out of PET, number one um, type of bottle. So that's one of the most valuable plastics on the commodities market. So a few hundred dollars a ton. Um, and so in, a, in the low value stuff that I'm talking about is worth almost, it's worth negative $20 a ton, around $0 a ton. So, so this is a significant difference. Um, that plastic um, PET water bottle will probably be recycled into something else, maybe another bottle. Um, and we would keep that lid on so it doesn't get lost in the system. The lid is made out of a different type of plastic. It's made out of number five PET, but that'll all get collected together, sold to a manufacturer. They will shred all the whole bale up and then they'll use a float sink test. And so they'll put it in water and PET is more dense than water. So it'll float to the bottom. PET and polypropylene is more, is lighter than water. So it'll float to the top. And so they can separate those two out and sell them to you know two different um, companies maybe that want to use it. And um, so and PT is, has a whole lot more people that want to buy it than than the other than number five polypropylene. So um, so when I'm looking at these kind of bottles, I'm thinking, okay, I know what's going to happen to each of these parts and kind of the likelihood of it happening. Um, and then as far as whether you should smash it, um, you should try to keep it in its original shape because that's what the their cameras um, at some facilities like like the one in New York City at a lot of the, a lot of the bigger cities have um, cameras where they can I, I like to think of them as lasers um, where the camera can see take a picture can tell what type of plastic that is which resin um, they're there are six different main types of resin. And then if it's the type of resin that it's programmed for, a valuable type, like a one or a two, it'll shoot with a little air gun, shoot that bottle into a bin um, to then be bailed up and sold. So it's pretty cool, um, but it has to be that valuable type that it's programmed for. And uh, speaking of valuable, what about uh, the, uh, so your average mm -hmm. coffee cup, including the top and the co actual cup and then the sleeve is what parts are or aren't recyclable? So the most valuable part of that cup is actually the sleeve. <laughs> um, wouldn't, probably wouldn't guess that, but um, so that is made out of a, a plot or sorry, that's made out of a paper that has long fibers, kind of like cardboard or paper bag kind of in between. So that should go in your paper recycling bin. Um, and then the cup is, it's made out of short fibers, kind of like tissue paper um, and, um, and plastic, lined with plastic. And so those two things are things that would both the short fibers and the plastic lining would, if you, if you tried to recycle it, if you put it in your paper bin, First of all, there'd be some concern about um, contamination. It might still have, you know, part of your latte in it or something. Um, and then if it does get, does get to the facility, even if it's not contaminated, it really doesn't have valuable material that the paper um, facility, the re paper, paper recycler is gonna be able to pull out and turn into new paper. Those short fibers and the plastic are just gonna kind of go through the screens and go out to the wastewater. Um, maybe have caused some microplastics issues. So unfortunately, not recyclable um, for the cup. And then the lid is usually made out of that number six plastic that is not recyclable either. 
So I would recycle that, um, that sleeve, but the cup and the lid, no. And then that maybe provides a little bit more motivation to bring your own cup. Um, and so that's part of my, part of the book is I decided to have it be this question of, can I recycle this? So we can walk through whether you can or can't. And then I think a big, big take home is to kind of bring your own as much as you can um, for things like bags and cups and, and bottles. And actually in that vein, um, my final products are plastic utensils, which is obviously something you get when you don't bring your own. Are these recyclable? Unfortunately, no. So again, similar to the straw, they're um, awkwardly shaped. They're not gonna get into that bale very well. And then they're made usually from number five or number six that really doesn't have that market, someone wanting to buy them. So again, try to reduce as much as you can. I know at, at restaurants, a lot of the time, um, if you're getting takeout or delivery, they're kind of automatically, you get utensils and people end up with a drawer of plastic utensils. Um, so you know, try to reduce. And then we're also working on policy. I'm a, I'm a legal associate at the Surfrider Foundation. Um, like I said, we really work on reducing single-use plastic through policy. And we have some campaigns called Skip the Stuff going on in a few cities right now, uh, where it's we're really trying to make it so that the restaurants have to ask first, like through the delivery platforms, um, have you say what you want. Like, do you want one fork and one packet of soy sauce? Then that's what you get, rather than getting all this stuff um, that you then really just goes in the trash. Right. And uh, I think this is a great segue into um, talking more about the problems in waste disposal, not just the environmental problems, but the social uh, problems, the humanitarian problems. So you mentioned microplastics earlier. There's a lot of buzz about microplastics. Uh, they're always being talked about. Can you tell us exactly what they are and why uh, uh, skimming the surface for plastics in the ocean isn't enough to get rid of them? Yeah, and so I think people concentrate a lot of the time on, you know, that the plastics in the ocean is a problem. And at the Surfrider Foundation, yeah, that's what I, I look at plastics primarily through the, ends, the lens of um, ocean protection and trying to protect uh, the ocean from having, from plastic pollution. Um, but a lot of the time, so the solution that people come up with is that we should just skim, skim plastic off the top. Um, and that's really difficult because plastic breaks down it or kind of breaks up um, in the environment. It gets, it photodegrades when the sun is on it, it can kind of uh, fragment. And so it breaks into smaller and smaller pieces. It's hard to see, it's hard to capture, but then also, there's so much life in the ocean. And so there are barnacles that get attached to plastic. There are, there are animals like man of war that are floating at the surface of the ocean. So if you're trying to kind of go in and scoop up um, what's, what's floating at the top, um, then you're gonna also get that ocean life as well. Um, and Plastic, like I said, has different densities. So some plastic will float right at the top of the ocean. Some will kind of hang out in the water column. Some will float, will sink to the bottom. And so just doing that kind of that exercise of trying to skim plastic out of the ocean really isn't going to work. And so we try to focus on um, source reduction, meaning using less plastic in the first place as much as possible. Um, and microplastics are a problem not just for the ocean, but for human health as well. Um, we're seeing microplastics all over the place. Um, we're seeing it in drinking water and table salt um, in far flung places all over the world. And so it's something that I think gets other people, gets attention. Maybe someone who doesn't care as much about plastic in the ocean does care about plastic being in their body. Um, and so and I think it's something that we're gonna be hearing more and more about um, and cities and states are moving forward with ways to regulate and ways to look at plastic in places like water bodies and drinking water. Yeah, I noticed that was a really important point you drove home in the book that about uh, it affecting not, not just the animals, but human beings. And I think I would hope that would drive it home for people to mm -hmm. um, realize the uh, extent of this problem. Yeah. Um, 
You also talk about something called an ocean gyre and you actually visited mm -hmm. an ocean gyre. Can you tell us what that is exactly? Sure. So I, I went on a research trip with a group called Five Gyres. <laughs> there are five big ocean gyres in the world. They're kind of like a, a vortex of different, um, from caused by wind patterns and things like that, that really draw everything um, to a certain place. And so uh, a lot of the time that used to mean, and still does, so still, still means that that's a place where animals go to feed their like nutrient upwellings and things like that. But um, there are now just tons of plastics in those areas because, that, because they've just uh, all accumulated there. And so I went on a sailing trip from, um, from Bermuda to Rhode Island um, quite a few years ago now and to look at you know, research plastics in the ocean. I was working on plastic bag laws a lot at the time and wanted to kind of see for myself what it was like. Um, and my big take home was just that it's really hard <laughs> to, um, to research or to be out there in the open ocean skimming the top. There's only so much you can learn um, at, in, you know, in a single trip, but there are people out there doing a lot of really important work um, but I just saw, I saw so much, um, microplastic, uh, we would be out in the ocean and I saw, you know, we'd see some items, but every trawl that we brought in the net that we brought in would have lots and lots of microplastics all just kind of mixed together with the sargassum, the seaweed, um, and the little, little fish and crabs and things that, that lived on it the microplastic had really become part of their environment. So that motivated me even more um, to work on plastic reduction. And in addition to this, uh, you did, we touched on this a little bit when you're talking about the microplastics in our food, uh, but I wanna delve more into the environmental justice issues affiliated with recycling, waste disposal systems. You talk a lot about fence line communities and how uh, they're impacted by our, our systems. Can you tell us what fence line communities are? Sure, so fence line communities are communities that live right next to some kind of industrial, like polluter. So a plastic production facility, an incinerator, um, and they're really having to deal with a lot of the issues as far as, as, far as fumes um, coming, from, coming from those industrial activities. And a lot of the time, fence line communities are in low income neighborhoods, um, they're in communities of color. And so it's something that we're, what, I want people to think about not just the environment, not just the animals that are involved, but also the people who are involved, um, the people who are living next to these facilities and having to deal with all of this. And I think one really great example um, that, that's gotten a lot of attention recently and had a lot of uh, victories is in Louisiana and St. James Parish, where that community has been pushing back against uh, new plastic production facilities there um, and has, has had some success in that and saying, we don't want more of these facilities in our backyard. Um, so I think that is something that hopefully we'll be hearing more and more about this as um, just from the human perspective of what's happening with plastics. Yeah, and uh, in addition to the human perspectives, um, you also talk about, and you mentioned this a little earlier on, sending our waste abroad, specifically to China. Um, and, you know, they've been taking our waste for our recyclables and our waste for uh, a long time. Can you tell us uh, more about that and tell us why China? Sure, yeah. So for a long time, we were sending our, our low value plastic waste to China. And the main reason was that it was really inexpensive to ship to China specifically because of the, the trade deficit. So the US buys so many more goods from China than they buy from us. So containers and on container ships were going back to China empty. And so it made sense that, you know, other places were are taking low value plastic too and were like India, but with China in particular, because of that really low cost of shipping, um, the discounted rate, we were sending so much to China and China really became a hub for recycling and particularly plastics recycling. And so a lot of family farms 
converted from being family farms to being family run plastic recovery facilities. And that wasn't necessarily a good thing because um, there are labor and environmental laws in place, but they were really not enforced. Um, and so a lot of these families were really getting bales of low value plastic, cherry picking kind of what the best things were and processing them and really kind of their own rudimentary kind of setups without any safety um, enforced and then taking the stuff that wasn't valuable at all and dumping it into the environment and or burning it, getting it and putting it into waterways. And so our, what we were thinking we were recycling <laughs> curbside, um, a lot of the time was ending up in someone's backyard in China and properly disposed of. And so China, um, there was a film, Plastic, um, Plastic China, I recommend checking out. Um, a documentary about a couple of the families that live at one of these facilities. Um, and I and the and the Chinese government really didn't like China being portrayed that way um, of having these families um, live with so much pollution. And so that was, I think, some of the motivation. Um, and then China and they also China's economy grew. And um, so they, um, China shut the door to um, low value, can, can, any kind of contamination of plastic that was sent to them. And now they're only accepting the really high value stuff. Um, but, and that's really changed how we operate in the US. So in the US before, a lot of cities were able to sell their, their plat, low value plastics on the commodities market and China took them. Um, now that that market is, really, really diminished. There are a few places that st are still taking it, but not for nearly as much money. And so cities at one point who were maybe making a few hundred thousand dollars a year on selling their on their selling their low value plastic commodities to other countries, to China, um, now are having to pay millions of dollars to landfill or incinerate. And so um but I want to see is really a difference in what type of materials we're using for our packaging, reducing the amount of packaging we're using. Um, so rather than, you know, this wasn't a good thing. We don't want to be sending our low value plastic waste abroad. We don't want cities to have to pay to landfill or incinerate them. So the alternative is to, you know, is to reduce the amount of packaging we're using and to make things actually recyclable. So making, um, making packaging out of material that has some value and then having the proper infrastructure here to recycle it. Um, and so I just kind of try to, I think with my book, I try to get the point across as far as just ba the basics of how recycling works, like mechanical recycling um, and have it so that people have some understanding so that they can hopefully be able to tell when something isn't um, true. <laughs> so I think there are a lot of manufacturers, a lot of companies want to sell, like promote market their items as being better for the environment. Um, now, right now there are companies that are uh, marketing basically incineration um, as recycling. And so a lot, of, a lot of the time it's called chemical recycling or advanced recycling. But in my book, literally, that's that's not recycling. Uh, we want to see recycling really mean something, really mean turning one item into another item. And so I'm hoping that um, people can have those takeaways and we can hopefully see them reflected in, in more laws as well. Yeah, and you've definitely, you've touched on, um, before you get to more of the solutions, you've definitely touched on, on a lot of them. Uh, and you've also touched on the marketing. Uh, one of the final problems you talk a lot about in the book is greenwashing. What is greenwashing and how can people use your book to help decipher the, what greenwashing is? Sure, yeah, so greenwashing is when companies are, are promoting something, they're pro promoting their product as better for the environment when it's actually not. Um, and so it's basically false advertising about whether something is 
recyclable or compostable or, or even kind of more generally marketed as green or sustainable. Um, so I try to give people some tools through knowing how recycling works, how, compo how composting works, how landfills work, to give them tools to be able to look at, at some marketing claims and um, decide whether that seems legit or, or whether it could possibly be greenwashing. Um, because my, and companies are so motivated to promote their products as green. They know that, that the average consumer um, and particularly consumers who care more about the environment are going to spend more money on something marketed as good for the environment. And so luckily the Federal Trade Commission does have some rules about um, whether Thing about when things can be marketed as more as more green, um, but companies are are often pushing the limits with that. Yeah, and I think this is a great segue into our final. So you mentioned something you you meant, mentioned better domestic processing, and better designs. How does better as a in terms of solutions? How does design, because you write designs at the beginning of a pro of before you even make a product, how does that factor into a better, a solution for a better tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've been spending a lot of time recently at the Surfrider Foundation looking at um, extended producer responsibility laws, so EPR, so we call it, and that's something that we, we see for other types of products, like we see for um, for electronics, batteries, some pharmaceuticals, uh, where the, the manufacturer has to pay for the disposal and recycling of a product. And so that's something we're starting to look at for packaging. Um, and so that would require, you know, if the, if the manufacturers are having to pay for that recycling um, and disposal, then they're more motivated to make a product out of material that's actually going to be recyclable and, and with design that design for recycling. And so, for example, right now, um, you know, the, the water bottle that you showed, um, that's, a re that's a recyclable material for the most part. But if that is made out of, if it's, um, if it's, if that plastic is a tinted bottle, like a green bottle or a black bottle, that pretty much doesn't have a market. If you put a shrink sleeve on it, like a plastic kind of sleeve that takes up the whole bottle, the machines aren't gonna be able to read what type of bottle it is, and that's gonna to go to landfill. So having companies be responsible for that recycling end um, makes, would make them pay a lot more attention <laughs> to make sure that, that, that that's actually gonna be able to be recycled and sold, per, sold to, for profit to be made into another, another item. Um, but right now there's really no motivation. If you're, if you're a manufacturer, you're just making, uh, you know, you wanna make your packaging attractive. Um, so the consumer wants to buy it and you wanna, you know, watch your expenses and just a lot of the time use whatever is the least expensive. Um, and it's not really thinking about whether it's actually recyclable or not. And so um, that small change would make a huge difference and make our, recycling system work a whole lot better. Yeah, so you've touched on the financial uh, motivations and also the government action. And that leads me to talk more about pol political solutions, policy solutions. Uh, you talk about uh, post-consumer recycled content, con content uh, policies as, uh, as part of a solution as well. What exactly is that? And how else, is there any other way that policy can play a, play a role? Yeah, so the the EPR laws um, are are would be a policy. Maine just adopted a law that would make the manufacturer responsible for the cost of um, recycling and disposal, and so that's a huge deal. Um, and more and more states are going to be talking about it. Um, I've I worked on a bill, a um, huge federal bill called the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, and that takes a, a lot of different policies, ex including extended producer responsibility, a, a bag law, a foam foodware ban, a, a moratorium on new plastic permit um, permits for new facilities, um, a ban on shipping our low value plastic waste to developing countries. So Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, and I kind of see that as the you know, ultimate goal. Um, and that was reintroduced this year. And that does include the recycled content. So re re requiring recycled content means that um, 
you're, you're saying, so there's a law that was passed in California and Washington that requires beverage manufacturers to use a minimum percentage of, of post-consumer recycled content in their bottles. So that means say, so it starts at you know lower number. So maybe 20% recycled content goes up to 50%. So that manufacturer, rather than using virgin plastic has to buy that certain percentage of, um, of recycled plastic that's been used by consumers, that's gone through that, you know, you put it in your municipal bin, that got chopped, that got sold, got chopped up and turned into little plastic nurdles and then sold to the manufacturer. That bottle has to be made of 20% used bottles, <laughs> recycled bottles, um, and then that number keeps going up. And so that drives the end market. So that means that more manufacturers are like required to buy of this recycled material um, to make new bottles because um, virgin plastic is so inexpensive. They aren't motivated to go out there and buy virgin plastic on their own. They're only going to do it if there's a mandate that they have to do it. And so that's what we're seeing more and more. That's included in the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act and a lot of states are moving forward. Uh, like Washington requires it not just for for beverage bottles, but also for like shampoo bottles and cleaning products and things like that. So we're going to see more of that as well. Great. And you, you've given us a lot of great outside resources and we will link that for everyone watching. We will link that in the bio and the information below. Um, so thank you for that. It's a lot of great material to go through. Um, as a final question, um, we so we um, speaking of linking, we will also link our local Greenwich resources. And if you're watching from outside of Greenwich, I, I um, we recommend you as the book recommends you to look up any local resources you have for recycling. Um, so that brings me to personal solutions. Using your voice uh, is a big solution you talk about, and one of the examples you give is the McDonald's example. Uh, could you tell us more about that? And then could you also tell us uh, how how making your voice heard can can really make a difference as an on an individual level? Sure. So I think, uh, you know, a big personal solution that I have at the beginning is um, is really bringing your own everything. So bringing your own bottle, cup, um, bag, and and that really sets sets you up for reducing your overall impact. Um, but that's really just kind of a first step. Um, really, the next step is getting involved, using your voice, um, getting like reaching out to your your politicians, um, your legislators to say, I care about this stuff. Um, and at the Surfrider Foundation, we have a lot of action alerts and things like that um, for you to, to look at to be able to reach out about specific things. Like right now, we have one about banning plastics at national parks. Um, but then... Um, the other the other personal solutions can can involve things like like corporate campaigns. So the McDonald's example is was with a, a corporate campaign where a group of students and a couple of nonprofits really pushed McDonald's to ban um, the foam foodware at McDonald's, and that happened quite a while ago. Um, but it was really it showed by McDonald's not using foam foodware anymore. It showed that other places could get by without using it as well. So I think it, the pressure needs to come from a lot of different places, um, from you as an individual reaching out to your legislators, from, from individuals um, reaching out in, in organizations, organizing these corporate campaigns to stop certain companies from doing things, and then legislation to really, you know, that then legislation was adopted more recently in a lot of cities to ban foam foodware altogether. But it was it helped to have that uh, McDonald's example in place already. Yeah, and the fact that McDonald's is so well known and is such a major corporation, it um, really shows how, how much of a difference you can make. And I think will really help inspire people watching to uh, make a difference and pick up a copy of this book, um, either uh, at the Greenwich Library, your local library, or a bookstore. Uh, are there any final thoughts you want to share um, with our audience about uh, the book or about the the what they can do? Um, sure. Yeah. Well, I would say definitely check out the book. It's uh, made it so that it is very. Uh, it's it's pretty. It's gifty. It's something that you can read. Um, 
just looking at the pictures and picking it up every once in a while, or you can sit down and, and read the whole thing straight through. Um, so I tried to make it as approachable as I could for a variety of audiences. Um, and I think in the illustrations by Christy, Christy Young it really made me be able to tell the story of recycling uh, so much better. So thanks so much for having me and, and yeah. And remember to follow those local recycling rules. Thank you so much for being here. I think you've given everyone a lot of food for thought and it was, it was great to have you uh, hosted at the Greenwich Library. Thank you.